Um, just, okay, let's give the do to the mythicist arguments a little bit. And I'll say maybe three basic arguments that, um, is that, can I see that in there? Yeah. Okay. Um, they make kind of maybe three basic arguments. A lot of it gets very complicated, but there are arguments that, that Jesus is not real, not a real person, it was just made up, uh, like King Arthur or Osiris or Zeus or something like that. They, they, they would say, first of all, it's, the, the gospel is just full of fantastical, impossible stories and things that aren't credible, don't make sense. Uh, Jesus casting out demons from a man and sending him into a herd of swine that run into the water. I mean, you know, crazy stuff. Uh, going up to a mountain and seeing Moses and, uh, you know, walking on water, water into wine, healing people, raising people from the dead, and himself rising from the dead. It's obviously a fairy tale. How could it not be with all of this ridiculous, you know, impossible type of stuff in it? Um, and then, that's one argument. And then another argument the mythicists would say, and these seem like good arguments. I, I mean, when you hear them, you go, yeah, right, they're right. <laughs> they say the sources of, of Jesus' life are all unreliable because he supposedly lived about 40 to 60 years before the gospel stories were written. And those gospel stories are the only really information we have about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's all we've got, basically. A little bit here and there, but that's all. Really, and those are just written by people who lived after Jesus, never met Jesus. So, <laughs> how reliable can that be? So that seems like a good argument, right? And then the last argument I think is the poorest argument, but which the mythicists beat to death, which is um, that um, Jesus is a, a kind of a composite character of other pagan myths. Um, and I don't think that makes too much sense because Jews would not be interested in pagan myths and be constructing a, a character based on pagan myths. But the mythicists would say, well, look, Osiris rose from the dead. Um, Greek gods were often born of, of uh, they were demigods, half man, you know, half human or half, half woman and half god. They're demigod. They were half Half and half. <laughs> and uh, so um, Jesus is born of a virgin, you know, so he's kind of a demigod, isn't he? Isn't it just kind of like, like Greek mythology? So, that, so they seem to have a lot of good points, but let's deconstruct them. Um, first of all, the last argument about Jesus being uh, like a myth, uh, like other myths. Um, goes off if I don't touch it. <laughs> Let's see, something else to look at here, first change. Uh, anyway, um, Jesus is not like a myth. Myths, mythical characters, uh, live in um, unreal realms of an indefinite time period. They live on Mount Olympus or in the underworld and they're fighting with other gods, and like Cyrus is getting chopped up by another god, and getting stitched back together, and then he rules the underworld. Jesus is a guy walking around on two feet, and um, he fits into his time and place as a devout Jew. He's not like a supernatural god. Um, as far as the, the virgin birth being like Greek mythology, yes, it is. And maybe that was applied to Jesus because, you know, all the Gospels are written in Greek. And so we know all the people who wrote the Gospels, they weren't right there in Palestine. They were, they were probably outside of Palestine decades later, spoke Greek. They were pagans who had converted to the Christian belief, probably. And they were, in any case, they were familiar with Greek mythology. And they would have known of, of this demigod idea. And, and when you call somebody the son of God, pretty soon you can literally make it that way. But the fact is the earliest documents, the earliest evidence, like the earliest gospel that was written, the gospel of Mark, doesn't say anything about a virgin birth. 
Paul's letters, which are even written before the gospel stories, written in the 50s AD, with, within 20 years of Jesus' death, they don't say anything about uh, a virgin birth. The, it's not until you get to the, to the gospel of Matthew, written about 80 AD, and, and the gospel of Luke. Those are the only two gospels that mention the virgin birth. But the gospel of Mark uh, doesn't mention it and even seems to contradict it. So uh, I don't think it was originally believed, like during Jesus' lifetime or immediately afterwards, that he was born of a virgin. That's, that's something that came later. And so, yeah, Greek mythology may have influenced those writers later. But um, yeah, uh, Jesus can be placed in a, in a definite time and place in history and ge geographically, whereas, whereas mythical gods they don't have a definite time and place in history. You, you can go back and uh, there are various, various methods of trying to date when Jesus was crucified, for instance. And they, they usually come around 30 AD. Right? There's obviously no dates in the Gospels, okay? <laughs> they don't say. There was no, uh, <laughs> the whole AD system wasn't even developed until obviously later. But um, there are ways, because of references to historical figures, and there's different ways of, of calculating when Jesus lived, okay? And they come around 30, 30, some outside end would be 33 AD. We know Pontius Pilate, for instance, ruled from 26 to 36 as the Roman governor of Judea. He was responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. So, so we know right there that it had to be between 26 and 36. And there are other references don't want to get into it right now, but so he, Jesus is very different. He's, he, he, you can pin him down so within certain parameters to a definite time and place. So he's not like a god, a, a Greek god or an Egyptian god. And the whole idea that Jesus is borrowed from rising and dying god, pagan gods is a myth because there are really there really aren't rising and dying. Uh, dying and rising, I should say, pagan gods. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a myth, except for Osiris. But he only ruled in the underworld after he rose. So it's really, really not, it's not really like a myth. Okay, we've got to get, get move on here. <laughs> I'm taking up too much time on that. Um, if you, uh, of course, there are many fantastical things, his, these miracles, or miracle cures, and so forth. But of course, we have people today who feel that they are cured by some faith healer or some nostrum. And Jesus may have thought he could feel, heal people, and maybe people thought they felt better after Jesus laid on some hands occasionally. We don't, of course, the people who didn't feel better, you know, you don't think about those, sort of like the, the uh, psychic who makes a lot of wrong guesses, you don't think about those, only the ones he hit on. And, you know, the stories get exaggerated, like a fish story, till pretty soon, you know. Uh, the healing occurred immediately, and it was, you know, blah, blah, blah. And people ma making up stories also. So, um, the, the, the thing is, well, strong reasons not to think that, that, um, that um, Christianity is just based on a mythical character is that um, you, if you wanted to start a religion, you wouldn't make up a character like Jesus who was crucified. It was a, some guy from the backwoods of the Galilee. Um, th that, is, that did not impress Jews of his time. They didn't believe that there could be a crucified Messiah. Messiah is supposed to be triumphant, it's supposed to be victorious, it's supposed to, to, to restore Israel as an independent kingdom. Obviously, Jesus didn't do that. He may have wanted to, but he didn't. So to Jews, it seemed absurd. As, as Paul says, uh, um, Christ crucified is a stumbling block to the Jews and an absurdity, you know, a stumbling block to, to pagans and, a, and, an, and an absurdity to Jews. Yeah. You wouldn't start off with that kind of, um, let's see. You wouldn't start off with that kind of character. It's very difficult to explain the origin of Christianity if you don't, if you assume that there was no Jesus, um, how, how did the whole thing get started? Um, how do you account for, um, 
how do you account for the origin of Christianity? Where, where's, the, where's the alternate narrative for how the story gets started? And we know that we've got Christianity rose shortly after Jesus was supposed to live. If somebody's making up a religion based on a mythical character, would they base it on a man who just lived recently, who's <laughs> people who knew him could still be alive even? You, you know, when people create religions, it's, it's about uh, gods who don't live in a definite time and place. They live in mythical lands. They can't be rooted in history. Their stories don't have historical characters in them, like Jesus. We have Pontius Pilate, High Priestess, Priest Caiaphas, um, John the Baptist. These are actual people, and they are part of the story. Whereas myths do not have... Uh, <laughs> mythical religions like Zeus, you know, they don't have uh, Zeus interacting or getting crucified on earth or anything like that. You know, that would never be. Zeus is not interacting with the political authorities in a definite time and place. So, um, and also, as you see, uh, the Gospels really don't portray uh, Jesus as starting a new religion. <laughs> That's the thing. The, the, the synoptic gospels, especially Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three, they call the synoptic gospels because they're so similar. They have similar stories. Um, they don't portray Jesus as recruiting Gentiles. Or you know, all of his followers are Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. He's he's talking about Jewish matters and concerns. He's um, he's not saying let's go out and start a new religion. Let's let's get, get rid of uh, um, Judaism or, or, or anything like that. He doesn't proselytize to Gentiles. He doesn't ever leave Palestine, for instance. And uh, uh, as he's, in fact, he says he, he doesn't reject the Jewish religion at all. In fact, in the Gospels, he says that uh, it, that um, he has not come to overturn any of precepts of the Jewish religion. He was very devout, very, I would think we'd call him an orthodox Jew, really. He said that uh, not one piece of the, of the Jewish law should be overturned. So he, he's, really, he, he's really not, the stories of the Gospels are not really serving the purpose of creating a new religion. And, and therefore, uh, these I don't know why Christians haven't noticed that, that Jesus never started a new religion. That was done by people after he lived, in his name, especially Paul, who never knew Jesus. But, um, so, the fact that it doesn't seem to serve a self-serving purpose makes you think that the stories really go back to the actual man, because, uh, because they, are, they aren't what Christians think they are. They don't, they don't bear out that... Um, that theology. Um, now, one of the strong arguments of the mythicists is that, look, these, these gospel stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are written at least 40 years after at the earliest, and the gospel of John is written maybe around 90 AD, maybe 60 years after Jesus' death. How can this have any, how can we rely on that kind of information and how, do we, how can we trust somebody to say, Gee, this is Jesus, and this is all we have? How can we trust that? Well, that seems like a good point. But the earliest documents in the New Testament are not the four Gospels. They are Paul's letters. And Paul's letters come, are written in 50 AD. And Paul converted to the Jesus movement within three years after Jesus uh, died. So he was originally, if you know your, everybody know who Paul is? <laughs> Paul originally persecuted the early Christian sect. He, he says he worked for the high priest and he would pursue them and he would arrest them. He was even stoning early Christians. Then he had his miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus. Maybe he had a heat stroke, I don't know. <laughs> but <laughs> in any case, um, like, like Aaron says here, uh, taking all the references, and the, obviously we don't have any dates in the, in the New Testament, but we have references to people, rulers who are ruling at certain times, certain events. 
And uh, Aramis says, when scholars crunch all the numbers that Paul mentions, it appears that he must have converted in the early 30s, say the year 32 or 33, just two or three years after the death of Jesus. So Paul is a very good early eyewitness to this movement. Yeah, he wrote in the 50s, but his knowledge of that movement goes back much earlier. Um, and not only that, although Paul never met Jesus, but he did meet Jesus' disciples. He met, uh, he met Peter in Jerusalem. He says, uh, Paul says, three years after his miraculous conversion, he went to Jerusalem and uh, tried to meet the disciples, but they were obviously put off because they remember what he'd done persecuting them for. And so they were not <laughs> too eager to meet him, but he did meet Peter and he did meet Jesus' brother, James. Jesus had a brother, James. How many people even know about that? But that's, he, he said he stayed with Peter for two, two weeks. And um, so, and then he, and he comes back to Jerusalem many years later and meets them again in order to try to garner their approval for what he's doing. He's kind of like his, got his own franchise going, running around the Mediterranean, trying to convert uh, pagan Gentiles to this, belief in Jesus, and uh, this is something that Jesus' followers never attempted. They stayed in Palestine, mostly, and especially in Jerusalem, and so, in any case, um, Paul does tell us things about Jesus, and he, re, he, he espouses things that, are, that, are, that Jesus also espouses in the Gospels, so Jesus, uh, Paul must have learned all this pretty early on. And therefore, he's the very, he's the closest we have to an eyewitness who we have a written record of. Um, even meeting Jesus' brother, James. And, he, and the, way, the way that James comes off is that James is a very devout Jew. Uh, and according to what you read in the book of Acts and in Paul's letters, He's not, he's not rejecting the Jews. Uh, he's not telling people that they can become, uh, the Gentiles can become parts of the movement if they, uh, by abandoning Judaism at all. He's a very, uh, he, in the book of Acts, he says, you know, he's following the, the Jewish law very strictly. So if James, Jesus' own brother was that way, <laughs> I, I think that Jesus was probably the same way. Um, we also have some, uh, you can make these kind of logical arguments. Also, the, the, the Gospel of Luke, this is controversial, but um, Luke wrote his Gospel maybe around 80 to 85 AD. How, how do they know that? How do we know that those Gospels are written at that time? Well, one thing is that they seem to refer to the destruction of the temple, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. So because, because of that, it must be that those Gospels were written after that, <laughs> after 70 AD at minimum. And uh, so, in fact, uh, Luke gives a very precise description of the destruction of the temple, but he puts it, he portrays it as, as a prophecy that was spoken by Jesus beforehand. But everybody believes that, that this is something that was retrojected back onto Jesus later that, um, anyway, Get back to my point. Uh, yes, Luke is writing much later, but he was a Christian from way back in the 50s, apparently, because uh, Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And uh, I'm not sure this name was really Luke, but we're just calling Luke, because <laughs> we don't know his actual name. It doesn't, the Gospels are written anonymously. They don't say who wrote them, they don't give dates or anything like that. Uh, those names, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels according to, those names were put on the Gospels later. Obviously somebody who's writing a Gospel, or writing something, doesn't write something according to. That's a, that's a third person describing, you know, if I wrote something, I wouldn't write according to Frank. <laughs> I would say bye. So, um, everybody reckon, there's no, there are no references to the gospel according to that phrase doesn't come up come up till about a hundred years after um, 
they're written. So anyway, scholars believe that those, those, those names are put on later. And what I was trying to say here is I forgot. This is Mithra. Some people think that Judea, Christianity has something to do with Mithraism. Um, compared to, to Jesus here. Um, here is a man with a Mithraic statue. He's got wings. He's got serpent uh, uh, coiled around him. And he, uh, he's got these kind of clawy feet. And he's standing on some kind of orb down here. I mean, this is obviously mythological. This is an astrological thing going on around him. <laughs> this is this was a cult, a, a, a uh, what do you call him, um, a mystery cult at, at, at the time, uh, stemming from Persia and also spread throughout the Roman Empire at the time, kind of competing with, with Christianity at one point until Christianity suppressed it. So we don't know that much about what they believe, but um, apparently they believe. Contrast something that's obviously mythological or mythical with Jesus hanging on the cross. This is a real man, suffering, executed. Big difference. You can, I mean, just visually, I'm saying, you can see the difference between a myth and a real man. Um, okay. All right. Um, so Luke, get back to my point from a digression of a digression. <laughs> um, Luke wrote also the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, if you don't know, is after the four Gospels in the New Testament. And um, it describes the early Acts of the Apostles, what they did and how, what Jesus' followers did after he passed away and went to heaven. And, um, and it especially talks a lot about Paul. Paul comes up in the later part. It talks about Paul's miraculous conversion on the road to Damascus from being a persecutor. Paul was always a fanatic. First he was a fanatic against them, then he became a fanatic for them. But he was a fanatic by nature. And he himself says, I was always very zealous for, for my religion. Uh, you know, and uh, I mean, so zealous that he's out there beating down a harmless group of people who believe something he doesn't like. I mean, and then he, then he becomes a Christian. And he kind of has that same fanaticism. He just puts it into a different direction. So um, anyway, in the book of Acts, um, in the latter part, the author, as I say, the, the book of Acts was also, the author was also the author of the Gospel of Luke. It's often put together as Luke Acts. And, and um, at the beginning of the, God, uh, 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 of the uh, uh, Acts of the Apostle, it's just, in my former book, Theophilus, Theophilus, he dresses as someone, Theophilus, which I guess means God lover. And in the book of the Gospel of Luke, he also addresses it to Theophilus. Um, so, in the book of Acts, at the latter part, uh, the author of Acts starts saying, when he's talking about Paul, he says, we, then we traveled here. We took a trip here. And at the end of the, of the book of Acts, the last three chapters or so, he gives a very vivid account of his voyage with um, Paul to Rome, how they were shipwrecked and all this. And he makes it clear that he was with Paul. He says, we. Paul and I, and others were also with them. So, if that's to be taken for true, and I, I think that does make sense, that he actually was a traveling companion of Paul, then Luke, the author of uh, the Gospel of Luke, goes back to the 50s at least, because, because the things that are being narrated about, about Paul's travels occur in the 50s AD about 20 years or less after Jesus' death. So, so actually, the Gospel of Luke, yeah, it was written in 80 AD, but it was written by a man who had been around the Christian movement for 30 years. And he, just, he says in the book of Acts that he went to Jerusalem and he met the apostles, Jesus's, some of Jesus' original disciples, including, he, he, talks, he quotes uh, Jesus' brother James, 
So Luke seems to be very well informed in any case. Even if you wanted to, I don't know how Luke could know all this about Paul, have all this information, if he didn't actually travel with Paul. Uh, and, he, and he just, he doesn't brag about it, he just says that he did. So I, I believe that he did, and I believe he's a very good early source of information, and he was in contact with, um, with some of Jesus' earliest followers, and he did, according to the way he, just, he tells the story. Um, none, of the, none of the Gospels claim to be inspired word God, okay? That's what fundamentalists say today. Every word is inerrant. That's a recent idea. The ancients didn't, didn't uh, say that every word was inspired. Every, you know, the Gospels are inspired word of God. The, uh, the first Christian writer, Justin Martyr, around uh, the middle of the, of the next century, he refers to him as the memoirs of the apostles. The memoirs of the apostles and the Gospels. But he doesn't say that this is written by God. That's something that fundamentalists say. Um, Luke, in his the Gospel according to Luke, why is it called the Gospel according to Luke? Because later, later Christians, looking at this Gospel of Luke, they try to figure out who wrote it, especially since he says we. So they went back to Paul's letters and tried to figure out who Paul was with. And they figured it was this guy, Luke. So they put the title of the Gospel according to Luke on it, thinking that that must be the author. Although, actually, there's not, we don't know. That's, that's just a supposition. We call him Luke anyway. <laughs> call the author Luke, even though we have no idea what his name was, and he doesn't identify himself. In any case, in the Gospel according to Luke, he starts off by saying, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most the excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed, have been told. So he's not claiming to be inspired by God. He's just saying, I've been around <laughs> for a long time, as he says, and I want to, others have written accounts, I want to write my own account. And because it would be good for you to know the truth, because I am very well informed in all this. That's what he's saying. <laughs> Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. So, um, anyway, I wrote an outline, but I can't seem to follow it. Um, yeah, some of these disciples are still alive, you know. Not, when Jesus died, that means his disciples died, you know. According to Josephus, Jesus' brother, James, for whom James Barron is named, um, <laughs> lived to about 62 AD until he was stoned to death by the order of the, of the, uh, of the uh, high priest. So... Jesus' brother was alive for about 30 years after. So there, there wasn't just a vacuum. The people who wrote the Gospels, they may have put a lot of, there was a lot of embroidery, a lot of exaggeration, a lot of fabrication. Yes, but that's just the fish story getting bigger and bigger. Um, there were people around who knew Jesus, and there was information, and there were stories that were from people who could have known, <laughs> you know. So, um, so, how do you distinguish between what is the made-up stuff or the exaggerated stuff from from what is the actual history? It seems like an impossible task, you know. If we got so much fabrication, it's, and even Luke is not an eyewitness; he's just somebody who was a secondary source. Um, we don't have an independent account by anybody who didn't believe in Jesus. You know, we don't have any historical records. We don't have any uh, newspaper accounts of, of what Jesus did that give us an objective account. We're all written by his followers who want to glorify him. So, and sometimes in absurd ways. So, um, what, are the, what, what can we actually think that we know? Well, the most secure fact, the scholars would say, 
about Jesus is that he was crucified, okay, <laughs> in Jerusalem. And that must have been the Romans because those are the people who crucified people, right? So um, that's a fact, it's such a hard, unpleasant, horrible fact that it's unlikely that, um, <laughs> that they've gotten that, that one wrong. <clears throat> that one could have been embroidered or been something else, you know, that's, that's a hard fact. Okay, Paul right. mentions, and Paul is an early source, but... So I, I agree with that. I, I've read uh, that there's some, something called a criterion of embarrassment or something like that. I think that's the term that uh, something so insulting really to Jesus that he should be crucified, um, they would not have any motivation to make up such an embarrassing... Yeah, well, it's an embarrassing fact. And, and, and so that speaks to its probable actual validity. Yeah, that's right. Story. But I've also heard yes. that it was on a big Jewish holiday, Passover, where it was pretty suspect yeah. why it would be done on But that that's day. just happened to be when he was in Jerusalem, you know? I mean, he came there for Passover. Yeah, but it was such a big holiday. Well, I know, and they, the, the Jews didn't... The, the high priest apparently sent guards to the men to arrest Jesus, okay? But they turned him over to the Romans, which... The high priest had done before. The high priest kind of in cahoots with the Romans. The high priest rules at the pleasure of the Romans, even though he's a Jewish high priest from a priestly class. Nevertheless, his authority, he has to, he has to play ball with the Romans. And also, here, here's some dirty business. This guy is a troublemaker. He's claiming he's going to, you know, unite the Jews or whatever. You know, you've got to get rid of this guy. And he was killed the next day. I don't think there was any trial or anything like that. That's just made up stuff. What? Yeah, I feel I would throw out a counter argument to your hypothesis. Yeah. There are a couple of people who were crucified and were religious figures that were worshipped because they were crucified just prior to Jesus. One of them was Simon the Greek, and the other was Simon the Cyrene. They were crucified just prior to Jesus. And I think that's what the Rajis. And a couple of others that were, they were basically declared to be messiahs, they were crucified, and at least in the case of Simon of Korea, there is some evidence that and maybe he, he left too. That he was supposed <laughs> to uh, raise him, but that at least that's some speculation based yeah. on uh, the Gabriel, Gabriel's revelation. The other one is John the Baptist, he was beheaded and he right. was still worshipped. Supposedly. Prior, yeah. yeah, prior to Jesus' crucifixion. Right. So there is that motif preceding uh, yes. Jesus. Yeah. It's no. interesting, too, that I, I don't even know what to make of it, but in the, if you read the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus Jesus preaching seems to be a direct response to to uh, John's, uh, the beginning of the ministry seems to be a direct response um, to, the, uh, uh, to the arrest and beheading of John the Baptist. And in the immediate aftermath of that, the rumors that circulated Jesus' teachings, there's people that seem to think that they're, that uh, it's John the Baptist resurrected, which is a which is a really interesting detail. But uh, I just wanted to make a comment, even though I I don't even know what to make of it myself. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, you could. I just never heard of it, any kind of religion or, or or myth that's based on a supposed human being who was crucified by the authorities. I, that's that's kind of not the way. It, it sounds like something that really happened to me. And uh, and Paul, who who was persecuting the early Christians soon after Jesus' death, he had some familiarity with that movement even before he joined it. And he, he makes clear Jesus was a man who was crucified. So um, that's in all of the all that we can have, all the records that we can have, uh, all, all, the, all the Christian documents. That, um, I, think, I think that um, the Gospel of Luke is the only reference to what, um, how old Jesus was. He says Jesus was about 30 years old. Get up, it's not quite sure. It sounds like if it's the inspired word of God, you think it would be exactly how old he was, right? It wouldn't, God would know how old Jesus was. But it's possible Jesus didn't even know how old he was himself because a lot of people in the third world today even don't know how old, what their birthday is or exactly how old they are. And um, Jesus, um, 
if, if we read um, the Gospel of, of, of Mark, which is the earliest Gospel, so much to cover here. <laughs> the Gospel of Mark, you read in the Bible, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? And that's the order that the Christians traditionally thought that they, the Gospels were written in, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And, and fundamentalists will still believe that. But uh, since, the, since the 19th century, uh, critical scholars figured out that no, no, no. Matthew was not written first. Mark was written first. Mark was, is the shortest gospel. It's the least mythological. Uh, it doesn't have a virgin birth in it. Apparently that story hadn't been developed yet. It has a lot of embarrassing facts, the Gospel of Mark, such as Jesus' own family not going along with what he's preaching. And Jesus goes, to, goes back to try to talk to the people in his home area. And they reject him. They say, isn't this the... Isn't this the, the carpenter's son? Isn't this, isn't this the carpenter? I, I, they don't even seem to be quite clear, remember who the hell he is even. They, they, they're very groggy about it, but they say, he, you know, he has no learning. Why, where did he get all this? And he is completely rejected. Even his own family says, try to stop him. Because the, the Gospel of Mark, one passage, which, which is the only place you'll read it, the Gospel of Mark, the earliest one, said so that they tried to stop him because they thought he was out of his mind. People were saying that Jesus was out of his mind. <laughs> so, again, this is not, this is a kind of embarrassing thing that sounds like historically true. Otherwise, why would it be in there? It certainly doesn't glorify Jesus. It doesn't make him look good. Um, it sounds like it's just recounting uh, what information was known. And uh, after he is rejected at Nazareth, uh, Jesus gives his famous lament, a prophet is never recognized, never honored in his own hometown or by his own kin. You mean in his own family. So he's basically saying, everybody says I'm just full of it and I, don't, I should just shut the fuck up, you know? And um, uh, so he, he, he says, well, a prophet is never recognized in his own hometown. Well, the local people will never, will never see you as anything great, you know. Um, so, what was Jesus doing all that time? You know, apparently he was not up to age 30, um, if, if, if that number is correct. Um, what was he doing before that, you know? Like, that's the big question, the missing years of Jesus. Um, living in Nazareth? eking out a, a subsistence existence with his family. Um, the, the Gospel of Mark says, doesn't directly call Jesus a carpenter, but it's, it says that the people of Nazareth said, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this the son of, of Mary? Doesn't, aren't his brothers and sisters living here with us? Where did he get all this? You know? Apparently he was not a, uh, a great religious scholar or preacher, <laughs> according to that story. Um, before that, um, so um, we're, you know, the Christians would say, well, he's just laying low. He's God, just working as a carpenter in a small nowhere village up in the hills, um, like like sort of like secret identity, like Clark Kent and Superman, I guess. He's, uh, <laughs> Nobody knows who he really is. I'm just a, I'm just a carpenter. You know, working away until age thirty. I mean, you think he would could have started at age twenty? You know, I mean, why? What's he spent another ten years? Just, uh, but actually, that's the only reference to what Jesus did, is that he's called a carpenter. But actually, if you go to the Greek text, the word is tekton, and tekton is not carpenter. It's, it's somebody who works with their hands, a, a skilled person. It's kind of a generalized term. And it, it implies that um, Jesus did not own land, so he was probably um, on the lower strata of society, if that, if that term can be taken literally. And tekton, that's a Greek word. What was the word that Jesus would have used, or the people who knew Jesus? Jesus spoke Aramaic. That was the language of the Jews at that time. And that's the language Jesus would have spoken. So 
Obviously, the Gospels are written by people writing Greek. They're obviously quite removed, and they're using words that we don't know, you know, if they really match up with what, what, how you would put it in Aramaic. In any case, we only have one reference, one reference to, to what he might have been doing. And everybody always says Jesus was a, Jesus was a carpenter. Um, we don't know that Jesus was a carpenter. Uh, Nazareth, contrary to what uh, a lot of people might think, was, was definitely just a, a, uh, a small um, a small place um, up in the hills, apparently. It, Nazareth is not mentioned in the Old Testament. The, the Jewish historian Josephus does not mention Nazareth, even though Josephus was in Galilee. He was in the town of Sepphoris, which is near where valleys, where Nazareth was supposed to be. There are no ruins of Nazareth today that we can go and say, look, there's where the town was. Um, the, the first mention of Nazareth in any written form at all is the New Testament. Before that, no, not on any maps. Even, even, even though uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian of that period, who was born in 37 AD, even though he was all over Galilee, he mentions lots of places and towns, um, he doesn't mention Nazareth. And Nazareth apparently just didn't rate any kind of mention by anybody because it's totally insignificant. And in fact, there's no evidence that it was even a town or a, it was certainly not a city. It wasn't even a town or it wasn't even a village maybe. It could have been just a rural area that was just generically referred to like saying, so he lives up in the, in the Boulder Canyon or something. It's not, not an actual municipality, you know, contrary to the, the way it's portrayed. Um, the, odd, odd, the odd thing about the Gospels is that even though it's, he's called Jesus of Nazareth, he's never in Nazareth, if you'll notice, except for that one brief visit when he goes back and he gets rebuffed and he never comes back again. <laughs> Why would he? Um, so, um, According to the Gospels, Jesus went to live, uh, he's never living in Nazareth, in, in, in the Gospels. He's, he's from there, but I, I can imagine why he was from there. There's nothing happening there. And, you know, he was, I wanted to see more of the world. I guess he, maybe he was the prodigal son of his own story there. Um, he, it says that he went to live in Capernaum. Here's a, um, before I get into that, let's just, I want to go back to this. This is what's from, um, from the Gospel of uh, Mark. Um, Jesus, his, his, his great inspiration and his, uh, himself seems to indicate, and the story indicates, was John the Baptist. It was after he was baptized by John the Baptist that uh, Jesus really began his mission of preaching. He may have been, obviously he must have been very religious and very devout before that because for him to go out to see John, John the Baptist, he would have had to walk a long way. I don't know, like 50 miles or something. John is out in the River Jordan, supposedly. And so he must have been, Jesus must have been very dedicated. You notice that John the Baptist doesn't come to Jesus, contrary to the way that Christians think of, of John the Baptist as being a follower of Jesus and recognizing Jesus' authority. Well, if that's the case, why is Jesus walking all this great distance to see John the Baptist? Why doesn't Jesus, why doesn't John the Baptist come to Jesus? Why does the mountain come to Muhammad? Um, well, anyway, Mark says, John baptized in the wilderness. And John the Baptist was a kind of a, uh, a guy out in the wilderness, supposedly lived on locusts and honey and lived on animal skins. And he, uh, was very respected. Josephus mentions him as, quote, a good man that a lot of people follow, but the upper elite did not, did not like John the Baptist. But so a lot, many common people respected him. Um, and as you know, he, Herod executed him because <clears throat> apparently he's getting too big a following. Although John doesn't seem to be trying to form an army or take over or anything. 
It's just that Herod said, here's a guy who's very popular. A lot of people listening are following him. That, that guy could cause some trouble. I don't, he, what if he does with all those people? What if all those people start doing what he says? So he nips that in the bud. And we know that John the Baptist is executed uh, according to the Gospels, but also according to Josephus. And if we didn't, the only other place that John the Baptist is mentioned is in Josephus' histories. So the fact, that, which were written after the Gospels, the fact that the Gospels know about him John the Baptist, and, and it turns out he's a real character, uh, tends to lend some historical historicity to it. If we didn't have Josephus' paragraph talking about um, John the Baptist, we might think he was just a mythical character made up in the New Testament. But when we, when we can verify certain things, or confirm them from another source, they often bear out. So anyway, Mark, the earliest gospel, which I say, oh, what? So not this part of Josephus, but other parts, have they been suspected of having been right. altered after? Right, that one part where, about Jesus. So, um, I mean, is he But totally the scholars do accept, I think all scholars accept the John the Baptist okay. thing. Is being, so and, and the John the Baptist, uh, Josephus' description of John the Baptist is a little bit different than, than the Gospels. So the Gospels are not copying Josephus or, or either one copying each other. And, 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 a, and somebody who was a, a Christian apologist, if he wanted to inject something into Josephus' writings, you know, um, since we don't have the originals, they all deteriorated to dust long ago, wouldn't, wouldn't have written what Josephus wrote. But yeah, they, uh, interesting, they, uh, uh, on that, if you, I have one copy of Josephus, and if you read the text, it's actually, it actually looks somewhat like it was inserted into the text, but also in the oldest uh, copies of that book that, that are in existence, the stories about Jesus are in some of them, but not in others, but the, but all of them contain the, the information about John the Baptist. Yeah, I'll, I'll call it John the Baptist versus Jesus on Josephus. There's a Christian apologist origin who basically is, believes who read the original text he mentions that uh, Josephus mentions John the Baptist, but does not mean, mention Jesus as the Christ. Right, doesn't so mention that, that Jesus knew. Some sort of independent verification yeah. of the John the Baptist. Je Je you would think that if uh, that was just a, a injection, there would be some Christian thing about Jesus and John the Baptist maybe being alive, but there's nothing like that in Josephus. Josephus doesn't describe them as being connected in any way. Anyway. Mark, it says here, John baptized the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance and the remission of sins. And they went on to him, all these people in Jerusalem, they were baptized and they were jerked, confessing their sins. Well, wait, Jesus went to be baptized for remission of sins? That's, I thought he was supposed to be sinless and perfect. Uh, the, here is Jesus going to be baptized for remission of sins. This is not Christian theology. The other Gospels, they, they basically, Matthew and Luke, they lifted this whole section right out of, of Mark and put it into their Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke relied heavily, right heavily on the Gospel of, of Mark. They, Matthew copied almost 92% of Mark's Gospel and incorporated it into his Gospel. I say Matthew because we don't actually know who the author's name was, but we'll just call it Matthew for convenience. Um, they just, you would say plagiarized, I think, you know. But when, when, when Matthew, he, he repeats this story about, he leaves out the part about Jesus and John baptizing for remission of sins, because Matthew fully realizes that's very embarrassing. How, how can Jesus be, John be, is superior to Jesus? Jesus is submitting himself to baptism for remission of sins? In other words, Jesus is on a lower level than John? Again, this sounds like maybe the real history. He got through, got into the gospel, even though it got admitted by the later writers who realized that's, we don't want that in there. Um, and this is when he goes back to um, Nazareth. It's not just the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brothers of James, Joseph, Jerusalem, and Simon. So Jesus had brothers, he had sisters, and they were offended in him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is now without honor, save his own country. And he could do no mighty work. 
in Jerusalem, in, in Nazareth, because people didn't believe in him. And he marveled at their unbelief, very disappointed that he couldn't make a hit with his, his homies. So, um, again, when Matthew, he copies this, he lifts it right out of, of Mark and puts it in his gospel, rephrases it a little bit. I've got it here. Um, he leaves this, this part about he could do no mighty work. He leaves that out. He says he didn't do many mighty works. He didn't, but Matthew doesn't want to admit that Jesus couldn't do the mighty works. He just didn't. You know, he, he switches the wording around so that Jesus does not look like he's impotent and dependent upon other people believing in him. This is kind of a naked admission that the only way he could do a miracle is people who were gullible enough to believe that he was doing a miracle. You want to say gullible. I don't mean to say that Jesus was a con artist. Uh, maybe he really did have a feeling for people, and maybe he really thought he could help people, and maybe some people really thought they were better, and that kind of stoked his belief that he could heal people. And, and Jesus healed people. How did he heal people? By casting out demons. You know, apparently Jesus didn't know the germ theory, which is, which is odd since he's God, or next to God, and he's getting messages from God, according to Christians. And yet he doesn't know the germ theory. He thinks that Jesus is caused by, by demons. Like apparently Jesus just, was just a man of his time. And I would say to Christians, how, how do you account for the fact he doesn't know anything? Um, so here's another passage uh, from Mark, early gospel, which shows you that kind of the more human Jesus, more humble Jesus, who's, who's, who's not, he's not God. He's not claiming to be God. And Jesus, and he was going forth into the way. There ran one to him and kneeled to him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, say one, God. So he's not even claiming to be purely, Why are you calling me good? I'm not, I'm not that good. It's God that's good. And again, when Matthew gets a hold of this, he flips this around, and he, he has the, the man, he, he lifts this passage, but he, he switches it, he tweaks it, so that the man is saying, um, what, may I, what good thing may I do to engage, engage gain eternal life? And Jesus says, um, goes off on a discourse, the same discourse that's in Mark, but he doesn't say, why well, call somebody good? Not as good to save God. Because Matthew, he wants to exalt Jesus to the highest level. And here's something that's not exalting Jesus. It sounds like Jesus is taking a very uh, kind of humble position about himself. So, so Matthew omits that. <laughs> you know, just, he, Matthew just, he just cuts and pastes anything he wants. And he's, he's very dishonest. He, obviously, he, he switches things around to, to suit himself and to exalt Jesus to the highest level. Like, for instance, in this passage in Mark, it says, uh, Jesus asked them, why are you arguing, uh, what are you arguing out of the way? When, when, when Matthew repeats this in his gospel, well, this implies that Jesus doesn't know what they're arguing about. So he doesn't know everything. He's not got psychic powers. He's not, you know, and Matthew doesn't like that. He doesn't like Jesus not knowing everything. So he, he admits that. He just, he does this repeatedly. So, um, Matthew's gospel is much longer, and Mark's gospel is kind of the, uh, the Model T version. All the other gospels follow the same um, ba basic outline, but they supplement their gospels with additional material. Which, where did they get the additional material? Um, okay. Here's... Here's Capernaum as it looks today from the ruins of Capernaum. Again, Capernaum is not mentioned in the Bible, not mentioned, it's only mentioned once by Josephus, but the first mention of Capernaum is in the New Testament. So again, subsequent archaeological discoveries and historical references confirm what we know about Capernaum. And Jesus, here's Nazareth, which is really a very small place. Um, just a few hundred families scattered around. 
Cameron is quite a distance. You know, this would be like walking to Denver or Broomfield or something. I'm not sure exactly what the distance is there. But um, he, uh, he takes up residence in Capernaum. So actually, he's Jesus of Capernaum. You should never hear about that. Apparently, Jesus doesn't care much for Nazareth. He doesn't, doesn't, doesn't want to live there. So I think Jesus was quite a, a religious seeker. Uh, what, he, what was he doing for his 30? He was seeking. He, he was roaming around. He was down at the River Jordan. He's in Capernaum. That's, the story begins with, with Peter and um, the other, some of the other disciples encountering Jesus on the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. That's where they first meet him. And so the story really kind of begins from there. It begins from there. And the fact that we don't know what Jesus was doing before that why? Because his disciples were not from Nazareth. They didn't know about his early life. All they knew is what he did with them and what he might have said to them about John the Baptist. But um, that, again, tends to add some credibility. The fact that, that we don't know what Jesus was doing reflects the fact that his disciples didn't know much about his earlier life either. So that's, all very, that's kind of consistent. If it had a lot of stuff that was in there that um, Jesus supposedly did um, before they met him, detailed kind of stuff, that would be very suspicious. But actually, the, the gospel stories only deal with like the last year of Jesus' life. And that's when his disciples were with him, and they passed on that story, of course, and they became oral tradition. Here's... So, one question real quick. So you think he was only preaching for about a year then? Right, but the Gospel of John says three, but I, uh, the early Gospel, the, the Gospel, the Synoptic Gospels imply only one year. Here's the, when the early, earliest, the New Testament, the original books are long gone. They've been copied, that's why there's some copying area, errors, mostly small errors. So, um, they will, the original scrolls, powder turned to dust, and, uh, but, this is something that was found in 1920 in Egypt in a marketplace, <laughs> but uh, found, found this little scrap. And he didn't, the guy, apparently, it's written on both sides. So here it is in the uh, you know, display case. This, this dates from 125 AD. This is a fragment of the Gospel of John. So the Gospel of John was definitely written, and that's the last Gospel. Um, this is the earliest evidence of. Of the, uh, of the gospel that we have. It's just a little fragment. The rest of it's gone. But it's amazing that even that fragment survived until 1920. So it's not universally considered to be authentic. Um, so anyway, I guess we got to, I don't know if we can go on here, but uh, as you can see, um, Jesus is up in Galilee. He's very far from, from Jerusalem. He's not, he's not, um, Let's see if I can find a map here that gives the whole layout. See, Jesus is spending his time up here. He, this, there's, there's Magdala, from which Mary Magdalene must have come from. It doesn't say that, but um, her name is Mary Magdalene, so he must, she must have encountered Jesus uh, somewhere around up here in Galilee. All his disciples are from Galilee. Here's, here's Jerusalem. Way down here, this, 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 walking to Jerusalem would be like walking to Colorado Springs. He's very far away from the main action of Judaism. And uh, Galilee is not occupied directly by the Romans. It's under a Roman top ruler. And the Romans are down here, in, in, especially in Jerusalem. Uh, during Passover, they, they would dispatch troops there to keep work. But, um, so, so, so Jesus was, was just tramping around this area and, and especially around the Sea of Galilee, and that's where he supposedly walked on water. <laughs> Although some people say that actually the story was he, if you put the word on and change it to by, he walked by the Sea of Galilee, the story reads the same. It may be that he was walking by and he startled his followers and walked out into the water and they, they didn't expect to see him. 
the story got turned around to he was walking on water. I don't know. We'll never know. But um, so there's Nazareth. There's Capernaum. And later on, I mean, this is where Peter is from. And uh, so later on, um, Jesus is quoted in, in the um, Gospels of Luke and Matthew as condemning Capernaum because it rejected him. He said, if, if, if the miracles that were done in, in, in your city had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago. You shall be dragged down to hell, you know? <laughs> and it, it's very angry uh, about being rejected. So apparently he's rejected Nazareth, he's rejected Capernaum, or at least get, he's got a, some people following him. He's not a dedicated small band, but, but he's getting a lot of opposition. Everywhere he goes, the Pharisees are giving him shit, saying, you know, you're not right. And... Um, so I think Jesus was not as popular. He was not as significant as people say he was. I think he was like this magnetic guy that everybody was talking about, and everywhere he went, people said, there's Jesus, or something like, I saw that in a movie, you know, kids running to Jesus, going, it's Jesus! They, nobody knew who he was. They didn't know what he looks like or anything. When he got to Jerusalem, nobody would have known who he was. He was, he created a stir among some people up here, a, a dedicated band of followers, and when he went to to, to Jerusalem for the Passover, uh, he would have been completely unknown. And among literally hundreds of thousands of people who are swarming into Jerusalem, um, he would have just been lost. So um, the, the, um, the temple in Jerusalem was enormous. And there were human sacrifices, not human sacrifices, animal sacrifices. <laughs> going on there, and that's, that was part of the, the ritual. Here's a reconstruction of what the temple might have looked like. It's a small reconstruction. I don't know. Obviously, nobody knows. Because the Romans destroyed it completely in 70 AD, putting down Jewish rebellion, unfortunately. Um, so, he would have been an unknown. Jesus was probably illiterate. He probably could not write, because 95% of people, according to studies that have been done, and of Jews at that time, had no opportunity to learn to read or write. And he's from a small, out of the way place. Would not have had a chance. Are we out of time? Yeah. Okay, I guess I'm going to wrap it up. Okay. Should I wrap it up? <laughs> okay. So, anyway, he, he casts out, he gets under dispute there. He, he doesn't seem to know the ways of the big city, shall we say. And maybe he had never been to the temple before. He, he overturns the money shares. Temple, the tables of the money changers who he objects to profiteering. This leads to his arrest and execution eventually. Um, and Jews before that defected, probably disappointed with Jesus. Jesus did not bring on the change in the world. I didn't get to all the other stuff about Jesus predicting kind of the end of Je just as some Jesus was an apocalyptic preacher. He he thought that God was going to intervene in the world to set history right, that he would, this wicked world would be changed, and that the Messiah would come in and bring about a change. And many quotes in the New Testament have been saying that. And Paul says the same thing, so we're pretty sure that he was an apocalyptic preacher. Um, and uh, obviously, his prophecies didn't bear out, and he unexpectedly got executed. I'm interested in.